Hello, my name is Arakli. I've spent a good 15 years um, uh, working on distributed systems and various kinds of APIs. I've even managed to write a couple of books about it. And uh, despite spending many years in APIs, uh, the biggest thing I probably learned about APIs is that APIs don't really matter. You see, um, APIs are just interfaces to platforms. And it is building useful platforms that we need to master in order to deliver business value at scale. So let me explain. I want to tell you a story. In the middle of this story is a, um, uh, the story happens in a large enterprise and in the middle of this story is a talented, dedicated, brilliant CIO. We will call her Michelle. Michelle is a highly motivated technology executive who is really, really passionate about efficiency. And um, some would say that also has a healthy uh, amount of contempt for any kind of wasteful, uh, wasteful activities. And uh, on this particular day, uh, Michelle was meeting with her leadership team. They were going through some organizational metrics, uh, looking at things like uh, Jira, burn down charts, uh, Git activity, other things, the kind of things that technology executives may be doing once in a while. And as she was looking at various reports and various numbers, her, her heart started to sink because what all of those numbers were telling her was that there were large parts of her organization that clearly were reinventing the same wheel over and over again. Now, Michelle was a very experienced uh, executive, so she was not one for knee-jerk reactions, but looking at the numbers, it was very, very clear that she needed to act. She needed to push for more reuse in her organization to reduce the number of wasteful activities. So she decided to uh, enact a new uh, mandate where she said any new API initiative would have to go through a permission to build process. So basically there would be a, a team of highly experienced um, architects put in place and those architects would have to review all of the new API initiatives to determine if this initiative was truly uh, delivering a unique business value or if uh, the team had to be recommended uh, for some reuse because this functionality already existed elsewhere. She also declared that uh, most permissions to build would be granted to platform efforts, meaning the efforts that delivered a large set of unique and logically interconnected APIs. And these APIs were supposed to uh, deliver um, significant business value to the organization. For instance, uh, there would be an accounting system that uh, allowed any application that needed any accounting functionality to get it from that platform. Similarly, um, there would be an enterprise customer platform where anybody that needed any information about customers or to modify information about customers, those applications go, could go to that platform one single unique place where all these APIs would live. As Michelle was explaining this uh, new mandate to her team and collecting uh, feedback about implementation details, she noticed that um, one person was uh, suspiciously quiet. John was a longtime lieutenant to Michelle, somebody who was usually not known for being quiet. So this um, uncommon quietness was definitely standing out. Michelle called him out and asked him why did he have a worried face. And John explained, uh, basically he said that he was worried about uh, total cost of reuse in time. Total cost of reuse in time, that was not a concept that Michelle had ever heard. So she asked John to explain what total cost of reusing time was which John did. Uh, you see, for uh, far too often, we only look at the benefits of reuse in a frozen point in time, the decision time. So when we evaluate whether something is beneficial for reuse or not, we will look at how many uh, uh, parts of the organization may need this functionality and if uh, enough 
need it, then we would determine that this is probably a good place to reuse. Um, let's say uh, a good example of this could be that um, multiple departments in a large company all need the same functionality. So uh, for the sake of argument, let's imagine that we're working for an online retailer and all business units want to start a loyalty and rewards program, right? So we have a new chief digital officer or chief revenue officer, and they said, loyalty and rewards program will solve all the problems of this company. And then we determine that, well, you know what? Uh, the direct to customer department, the small business department, the wholesale uh, department, all of this line of businesses actually need the loyalty and rewards program. So the decision is made to implement it once. Therefore, we're not going to implement it multiple times. We're going to save a lot of cost. We're going to maybe even save on time. Everybody is going to be happy. So this decision is made and we uh, march uh, along with it. Um, the implementation proceeds, maybe with some blips, but overall it's delivered. Everybody is happy, a lot of cost savings. Everybody gets great annual bonuses, absolute success at the beginning of the process. But now let's fast forward maybe six months from this glorious day. And suddenly small business has some business requirement where they need a change in the logic of the loyalty and rewards program. Let's say they determined that with this change, they could be making five more million dollars or whatever the number has to be. So they are really, really passionate about it. They want to do it. Now, if they had implemented the rewards program themselves, they would just go ahead and implement the change. They estimate it may have taken three weeks. However, because the reward system is a centralized platform, things are a little bit more complicated. So what uh, rewards pro so what the small business unit needs to do in this case is they need to discuss the change with the rewards platform and make sure that they get on the product roadmap of the rewards platform for this change because rewards platform has their own plans. They need to scale it. It's very popular. There's a lot of work they have to do. They're not just sitting around waiting for small business to come up with a change idea, right? They have their own timeline. So maybe a rewards platform tells them, you know what, we cannot get to this change right away. So we need maybe uh, three months to implement this change, test it, roll it out. So that's one thing that needs to happen. The other thing that needs to happen is that, um, well, small business is not the only customer of the platform. And as we noted, there could be direct to customers so retail uh, line of business. They could be um, uh, other lines of businesses using this rewards platform. So this change may not be backwards compatible. So the rewards platform is to go and talk to all other customers and ask them to adapt to this change so that the change is not going to break them. And they're also busy with their own things. They, have, they don't have any need for this change. So maybe they come back and say that they need a couple more additional months for them to adapt and that further delays this project. So now we're looking at, I don't know, five, six months for the change because it's centralized, because it's a platform, as opposed to three weeks it would have taken if it was not a central platform. So you can see how in time, because of the future changes, the initial benefit of reuse can actually start diminishing because every further change is a coordination effort that can delay things or make things more, more uh, expensive. Now, you can argue that in our example, we are being a little bit too dramatic and it's not that three weeks can really become five months. Maybe yes, maybe no, but also keep in mind that this may not be the only change. Once you centralize the functionality and create it as a central platform, there could be a series of changes, right? Today, small business needs some change. Tomorrow, maybe some other business unit needs a change. So as you accumulate all of these changes, the aggregate delay can definitely be very significant. And this is really what we call the total cost of reuse in time, right? So when we only evaluate the benefits of reuse and centralization at the beginning of the project, everything looks really good. But if we then look at the sequence of changes in time 
as six months progress, a year later, two years later, five years later, the cost of change coordination can greatly diminish the initial benefit or actually make it uh, totally worthless to the extent that because of all of these changes, because how much the central platform is slowing down all the business units, the shared platform that everybody used to love can become the most hated thing that exists in the company, right? So it really depends on what are the cost of the subsequent changes. We do need to evaluate the total cost of reuse in time and not just at the inception time. So what does this mean? Like, does this mean that we should never share anything? We should never create central platforms? Not really, right? What we need to do is we need to be very conscious of the total cost of reusing time and always evaluate it at the full life cycle of the platform. Uh, sometimes it may still be worth, sometimes it may not be worth. Um, we have identified through our own experience uh, some uh, guidelines for um, uh, quickly figuring it out. And one of the things that we often look at is the frequency of change. So it really, really matters the functionality that we're centralizing. How frequently do we expect it to change? Because remember, initially it's beneficial. It's only because of the subsequent change that the cost may accumulate. But if we implement something or implement the portion of something that just naturally does not change that often in the future, then you will not have a lot of those events that are costly. So it may still be extremely beneficial, right? So um, one of the best examples of uh, where uh, systems and platforms get this right is uh, one of my favorite examples of this are cloud platforms, right? So if you look uh, at platforms like AWS and uh, Google Cloud and Azure and others, and if you consider each one of the service they provide as an API platform, then you can see how they always try to implement things that are evergreen. They always try to implement the core functionality that is not going to change uh, too often in the future. So again, one of my absolute favorite examples of this is the uh, simple storage service, the S3 service from AWS. It was created about 15 years ago, basically as a way to host static um, resources for websites. So AWS was for websites. There was not much of mobile back then or much of anything else. It was more about websites. You would use EC2 for building your website and then to host like JPEGs and GIFs and things, you needed S3. That's kind of what it was created for. Uh, and uh, fast forward 15 years and now basically the same API that has not really changed significantly in 15 years is used for creating enterprise data lakes for driving massive machine learning programs like there, nobody could foresee 15 years ago that S3 would be used for any of that. But because they concentrated on this evergreen functionality, they were able to scale their platform to these changing needs without much of uh, breaking of the customers or changing their interfaces. So that's very admirable. And all other API platforms can benefit from using the similar design. So frequency of change is very important. There are uh, several other core principles that we have uh, come to appreciate that also stem from uh, evaluating the total cost of uh, reuse in time that I wanted to share today. So for instance, um, the principles uh, that we wanted to highlight today um, are if we look at the platform as the platform implements the core functionality and then people who are building on this platform are the customers. So if we use that terminology, then the first principle would say that um, the platform should never be the arbiters of common behavior for consumers built on top of those platforms. So a lot of times in large companies, when you build your enterprise systems, uh, you go with a functionality that's kind of least common denominator of the customers that you have. So you go and say, what does everybody need? Let me build it. That's not how long lasting platforms are built. 
long-lasting platforms, API platforms, they have an identity. They are trying to solve a specific problem and they will set a very clear boundary saying, this is what we're going to solve and the rest is still on the consumer. We're not going to solve all of the needs of the consumers or all of the shared needs of the consumers. We have an identity. We are a simple storage service. If you need anything but simple storage service, it's not our platform. It could be some other platform, but not our platform. So setting these boundaries is extremely important and the platform should always have an identity. You're about customers, you're an enterprise customer platform, or you're about accounting, or you're about simple uh, storage service. The uh, second principle is um, the platform should never orchestrate calls to other platforms. Uh, so S3 does not know about what other platforms you're going to use it for, right? S3 doesn't directly orchestrate calls to EC2 or Kinesis or something like that, right? So each uh, platform should be a, like a piece of Lego that has an interface and can be combined with other pieces, but pieces of Lego don't combine themselves with each other. It's the person that's building something with the pieces of Lego that needs to do the combination. So leave the orchestration to the um, uh, consumers, to people who are building products, but don't have various platforms call each other. So that's another thing that we usually see uh, done uh, incorrectly in the enterprise systems as opposed to public platforms. And last but not least, um, the platform should never implement um, the business logic that belongs into the consumer of the platform. So no product logic, no channel specific logic should be in the platform. Um, and this is something that is easy to get wrong because a lot of times when you build the platforms, um, you become a little bit of the crowd pleaser, right? You want to prove that you're useful. So what you're going to do is you're going to over index yourself in trying to deliver too much. You will go around and tell your initial customer, see how nice I am. I can solve all of this problem for you. It's a very dangerous road to lose the identity of the platform. So you have to really protect that small thing that you are doing. Um, for instance, like S3 never tried to do all of the things that Google Drive does or Dropbox does. It kept to like specifically defined identity it had. And in the long run, it was very beneficial for S3 because S3 is used for machine learning and data lake, Google Drive and Dropbox, maybe not so much, right? So preserve your small identity, your scope, um, and always know what you are delivering and what that means for not delivering as well. So as we wrap up this talk, um, I want you to carry this one thought with you, which is um, the time for a wild forest of APIs at large companies is over. Going forward, it will be all about purpose-built platforms that are self-service um, and that are delivered as APIs. And APIs can doesn't necessarily just mean RESTful APIs. It can mean RESTful APIs, GraphQL, GraphQL can be in uh, streaming, can mean data lakes, all of those things. But nevertheless, uh, the future is for the platforms. And we still have a lot to learn about how to build platforms that are delivered as APIs. Hopefully some of those uh, recipes and lessons learned that we shared today will be helpful for you in your own platform API journeys. Thank you very much.